right? Kind of reviewing chapter five, talking about membranes, right? And so just so you know, like these, these review slides are in the lecture slides if you haven't seen that already. So these are in the stuff that you have access to on Canvas. And they're not like completely comprehensive, but they do generally kind of hit all of the major points for any given chapter. So as you're getting ready, these and the quizzes and things are also kind of nice things to use is to, to guide your study as it were. So I just want to kind of make sure, yeah, that you were aware that that was available for you and you're kind of working through stuff. Um, yeah, just general study stuff. So these review questions and the quizzes are really good guides for, te for tests. And then anything that's underlined or bold in the slides and then anything that's like a numbered list, usually a good indicator that it's game for the exam. I usually try to mark things that are that are main points if I can. All right, but our last chunk of stuff, right, is chapter 10. So we're skipping a couple chapters, right? We did chapter four and five. Six, seven, eight, and nine are going to watch. Well, actually, no, you don't. Six, seven, and eight. We're going to push off to unit three, right, when we're talking about energetics and things. So we've been talking about cells and cell structure. And so now we're just going to wrap this unit up with talking about how cells make more cells, right? Because that kind of gets us back to that cell theory situation that we started the unit with, right? That cells contain basically everything that an organism needs to function. All of that happens inside of cells, right? And we kind of see how that happens. And another part of cell theory is that all cells come from pre-existing cells. So this last little chunk is just talking about how that happens, right? How cells make more cells. So we're gonna start simple and then kind of build up, right? So we're gonna start with prokaryotic cell division, right? Specifically in bacteria, it makes it a little easier, right? They've generally just got one little chromosome. They don't have any organelles to deal with, right? So division in these organisms is going to be pretty simple, pretty straightforward pretty easy to walk through. So we're gonna talk about um, cell division in prokaryotes, right? So like we said, all cells divide to produce two new cells when things are just kind of growing or multiplying, right? And they have the same DNA as the original cell, right? All cells arise from already existing cells and they have a copy of the DNA of the previous cell. It's this kind of continuous line of genetic information. And so in prokaryotic cells, we call this binary fission, right? So we're gonna talk about mitosis and eukaryotes, but first we're gonna hit this binary fission because it's just a similar process, but much simpler. All right, so in prokaryotes, right? Basically just a three-step process as far as we're concerned anyway, right? So you've got a little bacterial cell up here, no organelles, maybe just one single circular chromosome floating around there in the middle, right? And when we look at these chromosomes, so the first thing we've got to do, if we're gonna make two cells and both of those cells are gonna need a copy of this DNA. We need to make a copy of the DNA. And so with these circular chromosomes, what they have and what the arrow is indicating up there, they kind of have, you can kind of think of it like at their 12 and at their six, they've got these two points. And so the first one is an origin of replication, say up at the top, right? And then below that, there's an, a site of termination. So when this DNA gets copied, it's circular. It starts copying up at the top and it copies itself all the way to the site of termination, right? And once we've made copies all the way around, we've got two chromosomes now, right? We've made our DNA copy, right? And at that point, once we've kind of made these copies all around, right? they move off to opposite sides of the cell, right? Which actually gets us kind of all the way down to here, right? So we copy, we copy, we copy, they release, they move to opposite sides. We have two copies of our DNA. And then the cell just kind of gets a little bit bigger, right? We're gonna to have to turn into two cells. So we may as well bulk up a bit first. So the cell elongates, right? And those two chromosomes are now kind of at opposite ends of this longer cell, right? We've got cell elongation. And then the last step is that it splits in two, easy enough, right? This is called septation, right? So a septum forms, a septum is just kind of like 
can think of it kind of just like a dividing wall. If something is septate, right? It's got little divisions in it. Oranges are septate. These are wrapped up in little sections, right? So you got the septum that forms, the cell kind of pinches and then divides in two. And now I have two cells, each with a copy of the DNA from the original cell. So that's it for binary fission. We copy our DNA, we stretch out long, and then we split in half, right? Broadly speaking, that's the same thing that happens in mitosis, but we have a lot more things to keep track of, right? Chromosomes and organelles and all of that business. Right? So the first thing we're gonna spend a little time on is talking about chromosomes, right? Because that's your eukaryotic cell. It's kind of priority number one. You've got to get that information from the first cell into the cells that you're making, right? You've got to get it there correctly. And you've got to have all the parts because otherwise the cell that you're making isn't going to work. All right, so we're going to talk a bit about chromosome structure and then some words we use to describe chromosomes, especially through the cell division process. Things like homologs and sister chromatids, right? We'll talk a bit about kind of the way that DNA is copied just a little, super superficially, right? When chromosomes get replicated before cells divide. So every eukaryote's got chromosomes. Different species, different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes, right? Generally around kind of in the 10 to 50 range, we fall in that range. We've got 46 chromosomes. Each of your cells has 46 chromosomes in it. I think you do somatic cells anyway, right? Because we have 23, you can think of it like 23 kinds of chromosomes and we have two of each, right? You get one set from, your, from each parent, okay? So every cell in your body outside of like gametes will have 46 chromosomes in it, right? And all a chromosome is, is a DNA molecule. So a single DNA molecule in the nucleus of one of your cells is called a chromosome. It's just that science thing where we have to make very specific words for every single thing that we look at. So a DNA molecule is called a chromosome and they're super long. You can kind of think of them as just like really, really, really long pieces of thread. And so your nucleus stores them and kind of spools them up to kind of help keep them a bit more organized, right? So they're stored as what we call chromatin, this kind of condensed, wound up kind of thread, right? And so we can talk about two kinds of chromatin here. So not all of your DNA is expressed. So if we talk about DNA being expressed, what we mean is that basically that it's being used, right? There are parts of your DNA with genes that code for proteins that your body uses. And that part of the chromatin we call euchromatin, right? That U prefix means true. So your true chromatin is DNA that is being used to do stuff. But there's also huge chunks of your DNA that actually doesn't get used for anything at all. Just kind of taking up space and being there, right? And so that unexpressed DNA, the DNA that's not getting used to make proteins and serve any other kind of function um, that we've talked about yet, is called heterochromatin. So your DNA is stored, kind of wound up as chromatin. Some of it is being used to make genes, to make genes, to make proteins, and some of it's not. Right. Now, the way it gets kind of spooled up is that these long DNA molecules get kind of wrapped around proteins, proteins called histones. So you can think of the histones kind of like little, almost like magnetic spools. That's a highly oversimplified way to say it. But the histones kind of have a positive charge on them. And your DNA, because it's got all these phosphate groups sticking off of it, has a negative charge. So your DNA actually kind of sticks to the histones as it gets wrapped around, right? So DNA gets kind of spooled up on these proteins and the DNA spooled around these histones, around these little proteins is called a nucleosome. So the DNA wrapped around histones is called a nucleosome. Now, this is kind of like 
zipping zipped files over and over again. It's not as condensed as it's going to get. So we've spooled it up around these histones. It's a little more organized, but now we're going to start coiling up these nucleosomes. And when you make a coil of nucleosomes, it's called a solenoid. Electrical engineers in the room, right? So when we coil up these nucleosomes, we make a solenoid. Right, and there's actually even more folding that happens beyond that. We're not going to get this starts doing some really complicated molecular folding. We're not going to worry about that. Suffice to say that it continues to fold and condense until ultimately we form what's called mitotic chromatin. All right, so we have a chromosome. Chromosome is made of chromatin. And when it's condensed as much as it can, when it's like fully compacted, we call that mitotic chromatin. Because this is the form it's going to be in actually when the cell divides. It's like the most compacted, most organized, right? Ready to move sort of structure. And this is when you see pictures of chromosomes and they always make them kind of have that classic X shape. When they're in this mitotic chromatin fully condensed form, that's when they have that kind of X shape. We'll talk about why. We'll circle back. All right, so we've got chromatin in our nucleus, right? So all of your chromosomes are condensed down, right? These are a bunch of kind of mitotic chromatins, right? And so this is from some person somewhere, all of their chromosomes, right? So there are two copies each of 23 different chromosomes. And so this would be that person's karyotype. It is the set of chromosomes that this person possesses in all the cells in their body, right? And so we can talk about this in a couple different ways, right? Because there are 23 different kinds of chromosomes and you have two copies of each. So we can talk about your haploid number of chromosomes or your diploid number of chromosomes. All of them, all 46 is your diploid number of chromosomes. Right. You've got two copies of everything, which is double your haploid number, right? We have 23 different chromosomes. We just have two of each, right? I've got two copies of my chromosome one, two copies of two, etc. So I have my haploid number is 23. I have 23 different kinds of chromosomes in each of my cells. And that is my haploid number. Gametes have a haploid number of chromosomes, right? Sperm and egg each carry a haploid number so that when they join together, you get a diploid organism that's got two copies of everything. All right. So just to reiterate, right? As a human, each of your kind of body cells has 46 chromosomes in the nucleus. So it has a haploid number of 23, a diploid number of 46, and that diploid number represents the contribution of both your parents, right? You've got a copy of all 23 from one parent and a copy of all 23 from the other parent. They come together to make your full diploid set of chromosomes, which gives us the opportunity to make a new word, right? So for example, for my chromosome one, I have a maternal copy and a paternal copy. And they are homologous, right? They contain the same genes, right? If the genes, if some of the genes for eye color, or hair color, or height are there, right? They have the same genes. They're gonna be slightly different versions because my parents are different people, right? But those chromosome ones are gonna carry the same genes. They are homologous as far as the information that they're carrying. So we call them homologous chromosomes. Right. So each of these is a homologous pair of chromosomes. Right? Homologous pair of chromosome four, homologous pair of chromosome five, etc. All right. Now, just like in the bacterial cell, before we divide, we've got to make copies of everything. Because when your cell divides, it's going to pass down the full kind of diploid complement of chromosomes. So we got to have two copies of everything. 
So initially, kind of in the in-between time, your chromosomes, right, say your, your maternal copy and your paternal copy are just kind of floating around, hanging out as little single strands. To get ready to divide, they will each make a copy of themselves, right? So you've got, say, this is my maternal chromosome one. If the cell is about to divide, I need a copy of it. So here's the original. It's made a copy and they stay connected. That's what, at what is called the centromere, this kind of central region of the chromosome. They stay connected. This is what gives us chromosomes that X shape because you're seeing the initial chromosome and the copy of that chromosome stuck together. And that's why they end up looking kind of like little X's. They're held together by a protein called a cohesin, like cohesion, it's sticking them together, right? So the original chromosome and its copy are stuck together at the centromere by cohesin, right? And so now that we have two copies of my maternal chromosome one, for example, and two copies of say my paternal chromosome one, we can now talk about these two in relation to each other and we call them sister chromatids. Right? So these are homologous chromosomes, right? And now these are still two homologous chromosomes, but each chromosome is now made of two sister chromatids, right? Each chromosome is carrying a copy of itself kind of along with it, All right? So that when the cell divides, we'll have two copies of everything. No, right? So the rod and the slip rod individually passes down everything and it makes two copies? Yeah, it's going to, yeah, because when they, when the cell actually divides, these two sister chromatids are going to come apart and each one is going to go into one of the new cells. So we end up passing along exactly what we started with by the end of it. All right. So the cell cycle. Let's talk about the cell cycle. So just like binary fission, cell cycle is going to involve duplicating the genome, segregating the two new genomes, and then dividing all the cell contents between the two new cells. All right, so in that sense, it looks very much like fission. But we've got potentially dozens of chromosomes to keep organized and organelles to deal with. So it's going to be a bit more involved as far as keeping things in the right places, right? The amount of time this takes is highly variable depending on the cell, right? There are cells in uh, fruit flies that can divide in less than 10 minutes. There are cells in your body that will take more than a year to divide. So it just depends. But the process is consistent regardless of how fast or slow it's going. So, the cell cycle has five phases. Just to preemptively, or either preemptively confuse you or prevent confusion, mitosis, when we talk about mitosis, also has five phases. Don't get that cross-listed in your head. These are two separate things. So five phases of the cell cycle, right? So we'll walk through each of these. So gap one, In the cell cycle, gap one is the longest phase. Here's this one right here, the yellow guy, right? It's the growth phase. It's just nothing's being replicated or divided yet. The cell's just kind of growing and getting generally ready, right, to divide. Right, so that gap one, kind of getting ready. From gap one, we move into the synthesis phase. And that's where your whole genome, all your DNA, every one of those chromosomes gets replicated. We synthesize a second copy of all the DNA. All right, so the cell grows, we synthesize a new set of DNA, and then we move into a second gap phase. And then in the second gap phase, the cell is kind of more actively getting ready to divide. So it's another growth phase. And we start to form these spindles and microtubules that are going to be kind of the machinery that keeps everything organized in mitosis. Right? Basically, your cell is going to kind of tether everything to make sure that it ends up 
in the right place when the cell actually splits in two. Right, so we start forming these microtubules. They come together, make spindles at opposite ends of the cell. Right, gap one synthesis, gap two together are interphase. Right, this isn't actually cell division. It's a lot of getting ready for cell division, but division hasn't happened yet. So inter is between, it's the phase between cell divisions. Right, so it's getting ready to divide, but it's not actually dividing yet. Right, so basically of the cell cycle, all this is not dividing. It's getting ready to divide. Right, once we've gone through gap one, synthesis gap two, the cell can then move into mitosis. Very briefly, all mitosis is, is those spindles, right? Use microtubules to grab, they each grab a full set of the chromosomes, right? Each of those sister chromatids, pull them apart, the cell divides in two. That's mitosis. We're going to divide that process into five phases, right? Specifically prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, right? But all of those together are mitosis, and that's actually kind of dividing all of the stuff in the cell. And then lastly, we have cytokinesis. And cytokinesis is just actually dividing the cytoplasm. Right. So that's the actual one cell becoming two cells, is cytokinesis. G1S and G2 are I phase. Mitosis and cytokinesis together are called M phase or the, myto the mitotic phase, the mitosis phase. And so this is right here is where cell division is actually occurring. All right. So broadly, that's what's happening in the cell cycle. We're going to spend the next two sections kind of unpacking each of these in a little bit more detail, right? Oh, right. So this is what is happening when a cell is getting ready to divide or dividing, but most of the time your cells aren't dividing, right? Most of your cells at any given point in time, if you were to examine one of your cells, it's just hanging around doing cell stuff. Right? If all of your cells were dividing all of the time, you'd mostly be a mess. So generally speaking, your cells are not dividing or even getting ready to divide. They're just in this G0 phase, this resting state, where they're just doing respiration and all of the things that you need your cells to do so that you can carry on with your day. All right. But if we are kind of, if a cell has entered into the cell cycle, it's going to start with interphase. All right. So we'll talk about kind of the specific events that are happening throughout interphase and talk about kind of what's going on with those sister chromatids in the S phase, right? Well, basically when we're making the sister chromatids, right? That's S phase. So like I said, G1, S and G2 is interphase, right? And so what is happening? Well, the cell's growing, but we've got stuff going on. So we've got in the chromosome, we kind of mentioned this briefly, right? So I've got say chromosome one here and it's copy. And in the center of all of your chromosomes is this region called a centromere. Right? It's generally in the center, right? And it's this kind of constricted region. So if you look at kind of a chromosome, there'll be like, you're looking at kind of an image of one, there'll be kind of a space in the middle where it gets kind of skinny, right? And that's the centromere. And this is where when one chromosome makes a copy of itself, it's going to stay attached to that copy. Okay. So there's some kind of repeated sequences in around here where we can kind of stick these two chromosomes together, right? And so there's a little disc like Yeah, on either side. So you've got a centromere, they're attached together. You get these two little discs on either side. And this is where the microtubules and mitosis are going to attach, right? So you've got two sister chromatids stuck together at their centromere. And then they basically have these two little plates, one on either side of the centromere. And that is where the spindles are going to attach to them and pull them apart later. 
I have these little like attachment points. Because right? we're going to want one of these copies in each of the new cell. Right? So centromere, two kinetochores, they're eventually going to get attached to either side of the cell. So again, S phase is where this copy is made, held together by cohesin. And then during G2 phase, right, we're gonna start making lots and lots and lots of tubulin, right? Those microtubules that are gonna kind of organize and attach to all of these kinetic cores for every single chromosome in your cell, right? So in G2, the cell's growing a little bit more and it's making loads of tubulin to make all of these microtubules to grab all of these chromosomes. All right, and that's interphase. Interphase is fairly straightforward. It's all kind of straightforward, really. All right, so M phase is mitosis. We're gonna talk about those phases of mitosis, right? I'm gonna talk a little Good chunk about metaphase, a lot going on in metaphase. If metaphase goes wrong, then everything goes wrong. Right, and then we're gonna talk a bit about cytokinesis and how it differs between plants and animals. All right, this is mitosis. That's the whole thing, right? We've got five stages that we're kind of gonna focus on different books and different people will kind of divide it up differently. This is how it is in your book. So I just kind of stuck with this version. Um, I think in lab, you get a slightly more condensed version if you're in the lab now. But like I mentioned, so we've got prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. We're gonna walk through each of these in turn. All right, so starters, prophase. Prophase, the beginning of prophase is kind of a funny, very human-centric sort of delineation. So we say that prophase has started when a person can see the chromosomes using a light microscope. It really has nothing to do with the cell and its processes, but what it means, right, what you're seeing is that mitotic chromatin forming, right? Because when the DNA molecules are kind of out and a little looser, they're too thin to see, but as they condense down, they become more and more and more condensed, they become thicker and thicker and thicker, right? As they get kind of bunched together. There is a point where that mitotic chromatin is formed. And if you have the cell under a light microscope, you can actually see the chromosomes. And so that's prophase. You think it's pro, pro as like first, it is the first phase. Prophase is the first phase, right? And they'll continue, they'll condense down even a little bit more as you go through prophase. Um, but basically you've made this mitotic chromatin. At this time also, we're forming those spindles, All right? So we've got these spindles that are gonna form at opposite ends of the cell with all of their microtubules that will eventually start grabbing onto these sister chromatids onto each of these chromosomes. Right. So spindles are forming in animal cells, in your cells, centrioles form. Right, and so centriole attaches to the plasma membrane. So these spindles will actually kind of form these little shapes that attach to the actual plasma membrane of the cell using more microtubules. There's just microtubules everywhere at this point. Forming what's called an aster because you have this centriole with all of these little tubules sticking out. It looks kind of like a little daisy or something. So it gets called an aster. Aster is a word that's kind of for daisy, right? It's kind of little flower-like looking shape. Those little green, they look vaguely funky flower shaped, right? So you get these centrioles. Also at this point, the nuclear envelope, the outside of the nucleus, that double membrane starts to break down, right? Because we're going to have to open that thing up and get the chromosomes out at some point. So in prophase, that nuclear envelope starts to break down and the Golgi apparatus and endoplasmic reticulum are dispersed, right? They're just kind of like, Again, just broken down and gotten out of the way. That's how we're going to handle that. We're just going to take them apart, and push them off to the side for a bit. All right. So basically now in the cell, we only really have to deal with the chromosomes. Kind of tidied up everything else. Now, in prometaphase, right, we've been 
building microtubules like crazy. We've got these spindles attached to either side of the cell. So in prometaphase, the spindles are going to start attaching to the chromosomes at those kinetochores, right? So each chromosome has two copies. There's kind of this little kinetochore handle on each copy. So one spindle and its microtubule will attach to one side, other spindle and its microtubule will attach to the other side. This happens to make sure, right, because we're going to be kind of dividing this way, if you'd imagine, and you want one copy of everything to end up in each cell. You don't want to be missing anything or have double copies of stuff that'll make your cell not work right, right? So all these microtubules come out, everybody grabs a chromatid, and the chromosomes start to make their way to the center of the cell, right? Everything's attached. They're starting to come to the center, go metaphase. To metaphase, which is where all the chromosomes align at the cell equator or in the middle, right? Meta is kind of middle or in between ish, or however you want to interpret that, right? All your chromosomes align in the center of the cell. We tend to draw them nice and tidy. It tends to kind of look a bit of a mess, but they're all in the middle. Right, and so what has happened, right, is that spindles and microtubules have attached to all the chromosomes, right? And so if you have a chromosome here and there's a spindle attached to each side and they're both pulling, if they're both pulling kind of equally, the thing just kind of ends up in the center, right? So they're under tension, right? Each spindle has a hold of each chromosome at the kinetic core. So they kind of all line up in the center. We call this center region the metaphase plane. Right? It's just kind of this plane through the center of the cell where all the chromosomes are lined up. They're all attached to these spindles. And that is metaphase, everything in the middle. All right. Now, anaphase, shortest phase of the whole thing. Right? We spend a lot of time lining up and attaching and moving and organizing and getting everything where it goes. And so what's going to happen in anaphase is the cohesin is going to be removed from the centromere. Right? Remember, so we've got these sister chromatids held together by this little cohesin protein. And so at this stage, the cohesin is going to be dissolved, right? which is going to let these two sister chromatids release from each other. Like I said, they're under tension. So they're kind of like, it's like if you had two, you had like a tug of war teams going on and you just cut the rope in the middle, right? The things just shoot back to either side, right? So the cohesin lets go and they frequently look like this. You see their kind of ends dragging as they're being like ripped back to either side of the cell. It happens in the big scheme of things relatively quickly, right? So the sister chromatids, right? So chromosome one, my two sister chromatids, the cohesin goes away and each of them just gets slammed to opposite ends of the cell. Now each cell will have a copy. So we can divide this into anaphase A and B, right? So in anaphase A, that happens, right? That kind of elastic sort of kinetic cords are being pulled towards the poles. And then in anaphase B, kind of late anaphase B, we see that cell elongation happening. Right, similar to what we saw in binary fission, right? So the chromosomes get pulled to opposite ends and then the cell kind of just like keeps going a little bit. It gets kind of long, right? So you end up with one copy of every chromosome, maternal and paternal at either end of the cell. All right, so that's anaphase. In anaphase, things are pulled apart, All right? Telophase, basically just prophase in reverse, right? We broke everything down, we pulled everything apart, and now we've got to clean it all back up again, put everything back where we found it. So the chromosomes that were super, super, super condensed start to kind of relax a little bit. We put, right, that double nuclear membrane back around them, get them back where they go. So we remake the nucleus. We rebuild a Golgi apparatus and an endoplasmic reticulum over in each side around the nuclei. And then the spindles kind of disassemble and go their separate ways, right? So we put all the organelles together, we take all that tubulin back apart, right? And kind of undo everything we were doing in prophase. 
and that's telophase. All right, so after telophase, we get cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is just the actual getting to cells part. Yeah. So thing is, depends on what kind of cell you are. So if you're an animal cell or a plant cell, you're gonna go about this a little differently. So in animal cells, we're gonna use some more cytoskeleton fibers. We're gonna make some actin filaments Right, and we're going to kind of make a belt of acting filaments around the middle, right? So we've got everything to opposite sides. We kind of stretch the cell long. We're basically going to put a belt around the center and cinch it until the thing pops in half, basically. Right, so it's called a cleavage furrow, right? That's what we're doing here. Eventually, the belt tightens so much it slices through the plasma membrane and you get two cells. Right. This is easy for plant cells because they're kind of squidgy, right? You can just kind of pop them in half. Plant cells, why is this going to be more difficult or more complicated in a plant cell? What do they have? Cell wall. Yeah, they got a cell wall. So there's no like cinching and popping a plant cell, right? So they've got to kind of build a wall ahead of time, right? So all of this has happened, right? We've made our two nuclei. We've sorted our cells out. So now we're going to start building a cell plate. We're going to start moving all of these kind of membrane and wall pieces into the center and build a cell plate in the center. And eventually we're going to keep building it until it fuses with the outside of this cell. And ultimately what you end up with is just two cells that you've built a wall in the middle of, right? So it's making a room into two rooms by putting a wall in the center. Right? So at this point we've created two new cell walls and so now our Initial single cell has become two. Right. So animal cells make a cleavage furrow with actin filaments. Plants make an interior membrane or cell plate that eventually becomes a wall between the two cells. Where does that get us? Yes. And that is actually. We'll break a couple minutes early because that's just kind of a nice tidy place to stop. So we've walked through all of mitosis. And so when we come back on Monday, we're going to talk about a few different ways that the cell is able to control mitosis and make sure things don't go wrong and what cells do when things do go wrong. Do those happen sometimes? All right. So that's all I've got. Remember quiz and lecture journal due Monday. Assignment is open. Test is a week from today. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah.